Thank you for attending today's Martin Luther King Jr. Ceremony. Please welcome to the stage our Master of Ceremonies, Chief Diversity Officer, C. Pascal Easy. Good morning. Good morning. I'm honored to be your host today. And uh, we have a, a great turnout, despite the, the very frigid temperatures we have today. And that's, that's a great thing. It's a great thing. Um, exactly 95 years ago today, our better king gave birth to a, a boy who would later change the trajectory of history, pointing us in the direction of justice, equity, fairness, compassion, and righteousness. That man was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who left an indelible mark in our lives and in our society, in our world, and I'm so delighted that today we are celebrating his iconic legacy here at Western, Westland City Hall. This is a tradition we have here every year, and it's all well attended, and I'm delighted to welcome you today. We have a very elaborate program, and we are so honored to have the Lieutenant Governor, Galen Gilchrist, with us here today. We are also honored to have our Congresswoman, Rashida Tlaib. We will now dig into the program. Without much ado, please do join me as I welcome the Westland Police Honor Guard. And as they come, please, may Honorable Judge Sandra Cicerelli be ready to lead us in a pledge of allegiance. A round of applause for Westland Honor Guard. Please, you may be seated. One of my favorite MLK quotes is, it's always the right time to do the right thing. 
It's always the right time to walk on behalf of justice, fairness, and equity. On that note, please join me as I welcome the newly elected City Council President, Michael McDermott. Thank you, Pascal, and thank you for putting on this, this great event today. Um, I want to take a moment here to honor all of our dignitaries in the room who are joining us. And uh, for those of you who are elected officials or serve on one of our boards and commissions, thank you for, for all you do. We very much appreciate it. And we hope that you don't forget that every day should be celebration of Dr. King and carrying out his legacy, not just today. Um, I want to thank our mayor, Kevin Coleman, and welcome him. Our congresswoman, Rashida Tlaib. Our very special Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist as our guest today. Our Wayne County Commissioner Glenn Anderson. Our Council President Pro Tem Melissa Sampi. Councilwoman Emily Bauman. Uh, Councilwoman Andrea Rakowski. Our Honorable City Clerk Richard LeBlanc. The Honorable Judge Sandra Ferenc Cicerelli, our Deputy Mayor Jim Godbout. I'd like to thank all of our City of Westland administration and employees who are here today. Thank you for all you do for the city. Uh, Wayne Westland School Board Trustee Melanie Hines. Former Westland City Councilman Adam Hammonds. Former Westline Mayor Chuck Pickering. <laughs> Former Westland Mayor Mike Lando. <laughs> and I want to thank all of our board and commission members too from the city of Westline. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. As we all know, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man of faith. And we believe it is important in the cause of our important event today to have an invocation. And so we reached out to our brother, Reverend John Hearn, President of the INSTA Association of, of Ministers and Vicinity. I think it's called INSTA Ministerial Alliance and Vicinity. And he also serves as second vice president of the Western Wayne and ASCP. And he has a lot of other titles that he holds. But for purposes of our event today, we just keep it at those two. Please do join me as I invite him to lead our invocation. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Our Father, we bow before thy presence on this day, understanding, Lord, that we are simply the sheep of your pasture, and you are the good shepherd. So as we have assembled ourselves here today to honor the memory of one who sacrificed his life for the benefit of all humanity by standing for the cause of liberty and justice and equality for all, we recognize, Lord, that each and every one of us has a call on our lives. And we recognize, Father, that some of us may only have the cause of just lighting a candle in a dark part of the world and showing someone else how to keep it burning. But whatever it is, Lord, we pray that as we go forward that we will do those things that are good and pleasing in your sight so that our living will not be in vain. The question is asked, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was without shelter, did you take me in? 
whatever the question may be, we know that when we stand before you, we want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. So we simply ask, Lord, that you help us to find the will and the purpose you have for each and every one of our lives so that we too can be counted amongst those that stood for the cause of righteousness. So we beseech your blessings upon this assembly and all of those that will partake today. And we pray, Lord, that as we go forward, that we will never be without your blessings and without your sanction over our lives. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, that all of God's children say amen. Another amen to that. When we began preparations for this event, the mayor said he wanted one person to be the guest speaker. And a matter of days passed, and we got a confirmation that Lieutenant Governor will be here today. I'd like to just speak a little about the person who we have here today in the person of Lieutenant Governor Galen Gilchrist. He has dedicated his career to solving problems. An engineer by training, he uses thoughtful and fact-based practices to solve real problems and make government work better for Michigan families. Isn't that wonderful? As part of the Whitmer administration, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist has focused on helping Michiganders in communities across our state realize their full economic and political potential. From co-chairing the Michigan Joint Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration to helming the Michigan COVID-19 Task Force on Racial Disparities, I like that, to leading efforts to connect over 23,000 unserved locations in Michigan to affordable high-speed internet, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist is committed to building a more just, equitable, prosperous, and connected Michigan where everyone can thrive. That's what DEI is all about. Lieutenant Gilchrist, Governor Gilchrist and his wife, Ellen, reside in Detroit where they are raising their twins, Emily and Galen III, and daughter, Ruby. Please, let's give a West, Westland rousing welcome to the Lieutenant Governor, Galen Gilchrist II. All right, good morning. I first want to thank Mayor Coleman for sending that invitation. And, you know, he got to flex a little bit because he texted me and I said yes. So I, I appreciate it. But I, I am really proud to be here with you. I, I want to tell a couple of stories on this MLK Day. You know, there are lessons that we learn in every moment. Every moment of every day is an opportunity to learn a lesson, if we choose to be open to that possibility. And, you know, Dr. King spent a little bit of time in Detroit. Y'all know that, right? And touched a lot of lives when he came through here. There were a couple of lives in particular that he touched it doesn't mean that he literally met these people, but he touched their lives, because you can impact people without meeting them. And there were two little boys that had the privilege of being able to walk with Dr. King when he walked through the streets of Detroit. They got a chance to be there with their father. They got a chance to see this energetic group of people who were coming together for a common purpose because they realized that things happening in Detroit were not as they should be, that things happening in America were not as they should be but that maybe by a few people coming together, they could do a little something about it. They could at least call to attention the problems. Now these little boys, they, they were little, right? They were younger than some of the kids who are here today. They didn't really necessarily understand all the nuances, all the details of what was wrong, but they knew that like something was wrong enough for all these people to gather up. And they knew that it was something they didn't wanna like miss. Like it was important enough for their father, who was kind of a crotchety guy, for him to get up in the morning and for him to put them in the car, for him to drive them downtown to be part 
of this historic occasion. Now, I don't think that they necessarily realized everything they were signing up for and going to this march. Maybe they thought it was a parade, because, you know, kids like parades. I like parades. I've done a parade in Westland. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they didn't understand that they were going to end that walk at Tiger Stadium. Maybe they didn't realize that they were going to hear the first draft and the first iteration of the I Have a Dream speech. Maybe they didn't even recognize how profound that speech was when they heard it. But they were there. And they learned from the examples of the thousands of people who chose to step up and step into a future that had more justice in it than yesterday. Now, those little boys were pretty important to me because those little boys were my father and his oldest brother. So that wasn't even... <laughs> Earlier this year, or excuse me, when well, no, it's, it's 20 over, earlier in 2023, I got a chance to participate in a march that commemorated the anniversary, the 50th anniversary, 60th excuse me, of Dr. King coming and walking through the streets of Detroit to give the I Have a Dream speech for the first time. And I walked in that celebration, in that commemoration, with my father and my uncle. And what they told me about that day was that it is amazing how the, the, the human condition can be changed by other humans. Sometimes you need an outside force to change things, but more often than not, that change can come from within. Like, we don't need superheroes with superpowers to change things. Because our superpower as humans is the power of our example. When we think about a, a world that we want to be more just, more free, more fair, to create more opportunity, we have the power of our example to live that world into existence. With the choices that we make as individual people, they add up to a collective set of choices that lead to a better community, that lead to better cities, that lead to better states, that lead to a better nation, and a collection of nations that we call this world. I want to challenge all of you to recognize that you have the power of your own example. And that power of example can be on display for your children and family members. It can be on display for your neighbors and communi fellow community members. It can be on display for people who you don't even know but see you move about this world at your workplace, at your place of worship, or just at the store. Dr. King did say that it was always the right time to do the right thing. It's always the right time to be seen doing the right thing to understand that when you show someone what is possible in terms of doing right, it's more possible for them to do the right thing, to look out for people, to be inspired by your example. Dr. King had the power of his example. Now, his may have been visible on a scale that is greater than most of ours on a global scale, but it's the same power that we all have. And one of the amazing things that is true about humanity and about any system that we live in or live under today is that it is the result of people who made a set of choices at a point in time in our history. Like nothing just happens, right? Like these things, Reverend, I'm sorry, but they, are, they aren't ordained by God. They were decided by men. But what that means is through the power of our example and inspired by others, a collection of committed people can make a different choice, and we can do something different. We can create a different system. We can create different structures that support people that are more focused on life and opportunity, on possibility and prosperity, on connectedness and togetherness. And through the power of your example, I want you to make that choice. You don't have to be extraordinary to do something extraordinary. But the irony of that is that by doing something extraordinary, that makes you extraordinary. That is an action, not a state of being. So I, want to ch I hope everyone in Westland chooses to use the power of their example to make Westland better. Because a, a better Westland is critical to a better Michigan. And just like the trajectory of our state is not predetermined, 
Like we, we, have, we have to make a choice about how we want to move forward. When Dr. King, when the, when the leaders whose names we don't know stepped up and stepped into the civil rights movement, they didn't know what was going to happen. They knew what they wanted. They knew what they dreamed about and aspired toward. They knew what they didn't want to happen again. They didn't want to see people hurt. They didn't want to see people killed. They didn't want to see people discriminated against and left out of opportunity. That doesn't mean they knew exactly what was going to happen to get to the future that they dreamed about. But one thing I am so inspired by is that they tried. They tried. They didn't give up. They stepped up, stepped in, stood tall for what they truly wanted to see happen. They thought that everyone should have equal access to the right to vote. They thought that everyone should have, thought that everyone should have equal access to housing. They thought that everyone should have access to an income to actually support a family and not still struggle to make ends meet. They thought that poverty is something that we should not deal with in the future. They were motivated to try. And the last lesson I want to leave you with is that to me, the civil rights movement is about the effort. Like nothing happens if you don't try. Walls don't come down without a push. In order for us to live the future that we deserve, we have to give the effort that that future deserves. And I believe we all have that within us. And so I, I thank you for being willing to be part of this push toward the future that we want. Success is not guaranteed, but the values that encourage us, that drive us, and that motivate us to try, I can guarantee that they'll be a lot more successful than if we don't. So let's make progress together. Let's work together. Let's win together. Let's succeed together. Let's build together because together we can go so, so far. Thank you so much, Westland. God bless you. Thank you for the opportunity. Let's do something amazing for Westland and for Michigan. One more round of applause for our Lieutenant Governor, please. You know, have, having worked alongside our Lieutenant Governor uh, in the legislature, I, I saw firsthand his leadership, his ability to uh, work with others, and he was truly a trailblazer and a champion for civil rights in our state, uh, for equality, for justice, for a more fair and better Michigan. And it's my honor today, as Mayor of the City of Westland, uh, in recognition of your leadership, Lieutenant Governor, I'm going to present you with the key to the City of Westland. <laughs> So we are going to move into our, uh, our fireside chat, and I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Van Nguyen and Arthur McClellan up to the stage, please. today. Um, I'd like to tell you the audience a little bit about our, our, our guests. Uh, Dr. Van Nguyen uh, is a vice president and a financial wellness consultant in PNC Organizational Financial Wellness. She's dedicated to partnering with organizations to deliver customized financial wellness benefits to help move their employees forward financially. Prior to banking, Van's experience spans the automotive, healthcare, nonprofit, and educational sectors. Recently serving as the chief marketing officer at a community college, she promoted the college's mission and elevated the branch. Additionally, Van chaired the college's inaugural DEI task force formed in 2020 
and assisted in creating a strategic plan. Her time at Beaumont Health Finance Foundation helped advance the newly formed trustees to be community ambassadors. As executive director for APACC, Van launched economic advancement programs in the minority business community. She's also chair, uh, chair of the Livonia Westland Chamber of Commerce. She's an active advisory council member for Southeastern Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Center, board member at MCHS Family Services, and Ascension Providence. She's been awarded with Crane's 40 Under 40 Women's Leadership in Action Award and is an alum of Leadership Detroit. While attending Ferris State University, Van received the Distinguished Scholar Practitioner Award. Next, uh, Arthur McClellan Jr. is Director of Supplier Diversity and Development at Lear Corporation. Lear Corporation. His responsibilities include the administration and management of Lear's Supplier Diversity Program. Prior to joining Lear, McClellan held supplier diversity leadership roles at Valeo North America and General Motors. While at GM, he had an overall responsibility for the recruitment and development of diverse suppliers as well as implementation of GM's small business program. McClellan has held a variety of buying, purchasing, and business development positions, including the Chief Procurement Officer for the City of Pontiac, Michigan, and Vice President of Land Acquisition for the Farman Group. He served as City Councilman for the City of Pontiac from 2003 to 2009. McClellan has a strong commitment to serving his industry and the community. He is currently a member of the Board of Directors for the Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council, the Society of Manufacturing Engineers Education Foundation, Habitat for Humanity of Oakland County, Sheriff PAL Program, Care House of Oakland County, and the Pontiac Alumni Foundation. Well, welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for, for being here today and taking the time. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. So, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was, was somebody, uh, you know, really a legendary individual, somebody that um, was the right leader at the right time. Uh, he paid the ultimate price for, for leading our country in a better direction. And he certainly means different things to different people. Uh, but what does he mean to you as a person? Um, for me, Dr. King showed unrelentless passion for fighting for equality and justice. But he did it with such grace and poise and class. It's easier to say what's on your mind and just let it all out. But the way he delivered it was unparalleled. And as a corporate member and as a person and as a human, I, I strive for that. I'm not always good at it, but I strive for it. Um, the meetings he's been able to gather with people around the table, they leave with a better understanding, a deeper understanding, and become an ally when they walked into that meeting just as another person that maybe I shouldn't care, why should I care? So for me, I'd like to emulate some of those um, characteristics and traits as I lead a team or I'm out in the community and to have a better compassion for others. So that's what it means to me. Yeah, I'd just like to continue uh, with <clears throat> what Vaughn is saying. I think what, what Dr. King means to me is, is really the power of conviction, the power of what one person can mean to impact many. Uh, when you look at his trajectory, he was a reluctant young minister down south to take over leading a bus boycott. You know, that I'm, I'm sure if he were to look back and look to what he, that was not in his, 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 uh, uh, his future, I'm sure in his mind. However, when you look at, when you're at the right place at the right time, you're the person who can, can impact many things. And, and when you look at that, uh, what that could mean to you in your own life, uh, when you say, well, in, despite challenges and things that are, are confronting you, what can I do? And, and you look at that as an example of what, what you can do. And uh, what we, when um, we were speaking a little earlier about it's always the right time to do the right thing. And that's what it really, to me, uh, is, an, is an example of that. 
Well, and you, and you touched on something I was going to bring up next, which is, um, you know, this country has produced so many phenomenal leaders. If you look at the, the, the history of our country and, and mm -hmm. just the, the amount of leadership and uh, really groundbreaking stuff this country has produced around the world, and, and we've been an example for democracy and freedom and, mm -hmm. and justice, but we got a long, a long uh, path ahead of us uh, to do better. And so Dr. King, you know, his legacy is, is obviously uh, something that we're all striving mm -hmm. for and, and, and looking at, but what does his legacy mean to you? And, and, and why is his legacy so celebrated? I would go back to, 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 to my previous statement. I think, <clears throat> to, I think his legacy is important because of what it means as we are, are traveling this journey uh, of, of a democratic uh, union, we are constantly striving to be, as we say in the Constitution, a more perfect union. And it, it doesn't happen just because it's written down. It takes action. And that action sometimes uh, bumps up against reality of what, where we are. And what, when you see that someone takes the, the steps to continue us along that journey of being more perfect, to be better than we are, to constantly strive to do better, be better, we can, you know, that is his legacy. And I think that as we continue to carry out celebrations of his life and, and his works, it is always around that, how can we be better, right? Taking where we are, but there's always, we can be better. We gotta work together and the steps that we need to continue along that journey. Because we're not there, and we know there's a longer road to travel. And, and I think that, that if, if we look back at his legacy, it helps us uh, continue those, those things. And with that, you know, we have the day off. A lot of us, little kids and adults, oh, it's a day off from school or work. But really, I encourage people to think it's a day to be on. The reason why his legacy exists and is pushing us to be better is that we are supposed to do whatever we can in our power, whatever we're comfortable with, and maybe push that envelope of being outside our comfort zone and doing something different. So what I mean by that is a day that is federally recognized, but it's actually the only federal holiday that is actually a day of national service. And what that means is, for me at least, in the past, I've taken trips down to Charles Wright Museum as we head into Black History Month, to Detroit Historical Society. There's plenty of, of a plethora of information and resources around our great state and our great region that allows us to open up our minds. And that's, it's free for most of it. You just got to ask. You just got to connect with people to get you to the right resources. That legacy is teaching us and every single day after today, because it should be all day throughout, or all day, all throughout the year, on educating yourself, expanding your horizons. Be comfortable with the uncomfortable. In the beginning, when I was younger, I was not comfortable with being in a place where a lot of people didn't look like me. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was going to say something stupid, ask a stupid question, but really to build those relationships. Art and I, for those of you who don't know, Art and I go back about a decade yeah. work-wise. And I don't think I could ask him questions when I first met him that might may be sensitive and vice versa. But through trust and building relationships and getting to know each other as humans, I think that's the legacy that we're talking about today, is getting to know people on a human level to better yourself and to broaden your horizons. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Really appreciate that. So in 1967, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King made a speech in New York City uh, during the height of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a very controversial speech at the time. Uh, and the speech was titled Beyond Vietnam. And the message uh, was one of peace. And he really pushed back on the narrative of the time uh, that the war was necessary. Mm -hmm. And, and it really kind of embroiled him in controversy uh, in the last year of his life. And um, I believe that he, he really uh, put a big sacrifice out there uh, personally 
to stand up for peace and to spread the message of peace, justice, and equality, and, and that our country do the right thing. And he has a quote, uh, and his quote is, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. And I think it really fully expresses the way I feel uh, about people. And so if you could tell me, do you have a favorite Martin Luther King quote? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but, um, or, or just part of his message, yeah. uh, something that he, that he expressed in his life that you could share. And I'm going to paraphrase so, I, so don't, I, sure. I, I know I won't get it verbatim, but it's the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in times of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Because that, it's putting you in those uncomfortable situations, right? And that ultimately, are you a person of integrity that stands on your principles, or do you bend with 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 the 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 the, the, the whatever prevailing thought is? And to me, um, his life was that, and he stood on his convictions, and he was a man of integrity. And when he talked about peace, it wasn't peace and justice just here in the United States, as you, as you just alluded to in his, his, his uh, comments about Vietnam. It was peace and justice everywhere. And, and so it goes to show you what that means when you, when you stand on principle. Not just here, but it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's for everyone. And um, but to me, that, that one, that quote stands out to me. And I'm not as good as art of paraphrasing, so I don't want to botch this, so I will read it verbatim. Um, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education, which is reminiscent to me with what Aristotle said eons ago, that education of the mind without education of the heart is no education at all. And what I believe what these two statements mean, if we were to put it in layman's term, is I can sit here and learn all day long, read all the manuscripts and, and, and the books and the speeches that Dr. King and others have done. I can go to the library and read. I can read, I can watch document, documentaries, podcasts, whatever it may be. There's a plethora of resources out there to educate you. But if your heart's not open to exploring new ways to connect with each other, to empathize and sympathize where their pathway has been, then you're doing yourself a disjustice to yourself. And so education is one thing that people can't take away from you. Everything else, Art and I were talking about this earlier. Your materialistic possessions can be taken away from you, money, all that. But once you have that education of the mind and heart, nobody can take that away from you. So how can you use that and leverage that to connect with others and understand them? That's great. Thank you so much. In his April 16th, 1963 letter from Birmingham, <coughs> Alabama, from the Birmingham, Alabama jail, Dr. King wrote that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. He made that statement 60 years ago. And, and how, how do you feel that that applies to our society today? It still does. Yeah, right. Was, <laughs> it still was, does. Yeah, it, it applies. It applies. Um, if we take it in the context of everyday life, we all, most of us in here, have either worked full time or currently work full time or work at all. And you've been in circumstances where you've seen something. And so even as little ones, see something, say something, that, that sentence, it applies to school, work, uh, public settings, community gatherings, right? We've heard that phrase before. So can we take that phrase and apply it in terms of the lens of justice and equity? So a, a, an example that comes to mind, peeling back the layers. In the past, I have been in part of a team where a manager just belittled and berated one of my colleagues. We won't, won't go into detail, but at the end of the day, it was in front of others, but it wasn't directed towards me. So I'm like, I'm off the hook. Uh, they're not mad at me. But what am I doing for my colleagues? Nothing, if I don't stand up. Because they, they were just in shock that they couldn't, they couldn't speak up. So I found the right time, found a strategy 
to deliver the content in a way it was well received, to say, hey, that's not the right way you should be treating people. Because you didn't want to be treated like that. What if it, that was for you? So really say something, see, see something, say something applies to you're letting injustice happen everywhere if you don't speak up in your own methodical, strategic way. Yeah, I'm going to take a different take sure. on that. If you look at if the, the, the outlay of what's happening around the country now, and you, you look at the various interpretation of laws across different states. If you go to one state, you can do one thing. You come to another state, you can do another thing. And you look at that level of inconsistency. And when we talk about standing on standards and integrity, you, you see that. And so what you want is something that is consistent for everyone, everywhere. And that is, I think, is getting to where you talk about injustice anywhere is, is, a, is an attack against justice everywhere. It, it's because of the levels of inconsistency that, that breed these, the things that we find ourselves in in, in a lot of cases. And so um, the, the, the thing that we're looking for as citizens and, 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 and uh, participants in this democracy is that level of consistency uh, across the board. If it's good for me here in Michigan, it should be good for me in Ohio. It should be good for me in Wisconsin. It should be good for me in Illinois. But what we're finding is there are variations up and down the scale uh, with, with, with various uh, things that are being passed. So I think what we really want is to make sure that, that the, 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 the playing field is level across the board and it's consistent for everybody. Well, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we know that Dr. King traveled to countries like India and Ghana to deepen his ideals of nonviolence and social justice. After returning from Ghana's March 6, 1957 independence celebration at the invitation of Nkrumah, King channeled Nkrumah in declaring that we cannot have second-class citizens. So what are your thoughts on treating everyone in our community with dignity and fairness? You know, Mr. Mayor, there was a and I, and, I, and I was listening to, I forget what it was, but it was a little book. And it said, everything I needed to know, I learned in kindergarten, right? Respect, how to share, teamwork, you know, getting along, working together to, to accomplish a goal. Those are things we learned down here. But somehow when we matriculate up to here, things change. And so <clears throat> I think when you, when you, when you look at that it's 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 very important that uh, uh, we go back to just basics. It's like it, the respect of one person to another. See the humanity in each other. You know, there we are. We are here, uh, regardless if folks want us to be here or not. We are here together. So how do we work together to to make everyone to to, to ensure there's benefits for everyone as we move forward? So as we move forward together, we grow. You know, if we're divided, uh, we're, we're going to stagnate. And, and so I think that the message is we need to continue to strive for that more perfect union. We need to continue to strive to push each other to be better. Um, and that collectively, we can accomplish more than individually. And to piggyback off that, really just being open to learning during this process. There are people in your life and who come into your circle that may have seemed to have it all put together, but there's a story behind each individual, including myself. And if you don't intently listen, and when I say intently listen, I mean listen with all five senses, not just with your ears, because sometimes it's in and out. My husband would know. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, truly engage. Don't multitask when you're in that team meeting. Listen to your family members when they come to you with maybe not asking for a solution. Because sometimes type A personalities like myself, I'm always trying to provide a solution to help you out. But sometimes they don't need that. They just need you to listen. And if they ask for your help, then that's when you can go at it together to make change. I hear you. I hear you. And we could all probably do a better job of yeah. that, right? Yeah. So thank you. So finally, can one truly celebrate King's legacy without embracing his dedicated pursuit of a nonviolent, beloved community that strongly fought poverty, hunger, and homelessness? 
Can one? Yes. I, I believe so. I think um, <clears throat> the, 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 the challenge is, again, is that, that collective working uh, together. Uh, we, we are so divided today uh, on, on so many issues. Um, I think we really have to take a step back and, and really uh, let everyone understand where we are, where we have commonality, and work from that base. Um, <coughs> Because at the end of the day, uh, I, in my last comments, you know, collectively we can accomplish so much more, so much more than if we're individually trying to do things. And, and that, that, that separation that divides us, you know, when you, when you really cut through all of the, the BS, um, it's, not that, it's not that much of a difference. We all want the same thing. We want good education. We want quality uh, uh, schools. We want uh, uh, good government to work that, that helps benefit everyone in the communities. So when you look at this divide, you know, it really is, is, is it in, in the margins. Uh, it's not on, the, on, the, on the, the, the big picture things. And so I think uh, as we continue to push each other, it's got to be around those things where we can make each other better. And, and um, you know, I think the lieutenant governor hit it. We need to be our own example. We can make a difference. Our individual, we can do some things ourselves. And I think that's the, the message that we take away is that, you know, despite everything that's going on, there are things you can do to help further uh, making this a, a more perfect union. And that's that day of service that I referenced to earlier. What can you do today after leaving this get together? What, who are you going to talk to? Who are you going to call? Where are you going to go? What are you going to read? Just for you. You don't need to make it this grandiose scheme of, look at me, I'm doing something good. Do it for yourself, really. Educate yourself, make your heart fuller, grow your knowledge, grow your brain. I think that's how we move together. And then you find allies that you then say, okay, how can we fix this problem, perhaps in this community for homelessness, food insecurity? That's what Dr. King was talking about. You have to bridge those gaps of basic human needs in order to accomplish greater, bigger things. And so just take away from that when you leave here today, what one thing will you do to move that needle forward? Well, I just want to take a moment to thank you both for sharing such thoughtful insight. Thank you. I think we all found that very interesting uh, and enjoyed it very much. And so I'd, I'd just like to take a moment to thank you both for, for taking the time today. This is really awesome and interesting. And, a round of applause Thank for you. our guest speakers Thank today. You. Thank you. Another round of applause for the mayor and our discussants, Dr. Wayne and Arthur McLellan. We're gradually coming to the end of our event today. And I would like to extend our gratitude to our sponsors, especially Starbucks, for helping us. They've done that all, always, every year. They do help us to put together this event. And I'd like to say a big thank you to them. i also like to thank all members of the event organizing committee of the city. Uh, for being diligent in putting this together. It's been some days and weeks of preparation. I'd also like to thank all guests. Uh, thank you for, for agreeing to come. Uh, we uh, sent you an email and you said yes. We sent you an email and you said yes. And, and that, that really uh, brightened our hearts as we look forward to today. Uh, we also want to thank the Lieutenant Governor just left and uh, the Congress um, woman just left, and we also have many elected officials that are here, and also my colleagues, uh, the administration, for all the efforts you put into making sure that this event is successful today. Now, uh, we usually round up with uh, uh, our brother who does uh, some magic with his saxophone, and um, he's here today, and when we reach out to him, he said, but with all pleasure, you know, I like to get that kind of positive response. You know, when I send a, a text message or an email to someone to say, hey, 
were doing this event, and he was willing uh, to be part of it. And uh, he is going to come uh, on stage shortly. Now, if you look at the back of the program, we have the lyrics of the song, and we invite you to sing along. If you know how to sing it, please do join. It's a very powerful song, and I know he's going to do justice, justice uh, to it. Uh, so please do join me uh, as I welcome on stage our brother, the saxophonist, Stephen Thomas. That concludes our MLK ceremony today. Thank you very much for coming. Drive safe and stay warm. <laughs>